Hi, this is Steve. Thanks for joining us. We're studying together 2 Corinthians. In our last study together, we were at verse 2 of chapter 8. It seems the, that the popular idea that's brought forth today is that Paul had this really intense desire to prove to the Jewish Christians that the Gentiles really, were, they just weren't really all that bad. And so he engineered this great collection. And so here's proof that the Gentiles are not anti-Semitic. You know, you know, Paul was out of the will of the Lord in doing this. You know, this was a carnal desire on his own part to get back at his Jewish friends. You know, because he had said, well, I wash my hands of you. I go to the Gentiles. And that because of the carnality of the situation, God had Paul arrested, thrown in prison, or that he never again freely preached the word. But it really seems unreasonable to me that the Holy Spirit would dedicate two or three chapters to giving us a really vivid illustration of Paul's carnality. Now what I see is the grace of God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that you give us to come together and feast upon your word. We're so aware of our limitations. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not true, seal to our hearts that which is true, so that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you so that we may set our affections on things above, above, not on things below. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. God tells me that Lot was righteous. I don't, I don't find any place in the New Testament, no place, where God ever mentions any sin or guilt of any believer in the Old Testament. What I see is the supreme grace of my wonderful Lord and that he sees Lot as righteous and that he doesn't mention Moses' transgressions, uh, departures from the faith, the fact that he didn't believe and because he didn't believe he didn't take the children uh, 
of Israel into the promised land, all covered by the blood. So why should there then be so much scripture dedicated to some slip in Paul's life? First of all, I have repeated over and over again, I'm convinced that this is written by the Holy Spirit. Paul just merely was a tool in the completion of the Word of God and that what it contains is God's message. Surely influenced by the history and the time in which it was set, but, but it is timeless in its application. So I'm going to launch into these two chapters from a slightly different, uh, different premise. Number one, that we are still reading the Word of God as written by the Holy Spirit, and that the supremacy of the message is not to teach us that, that Paul messed up, but to teach us something. Now, in 1 Corinthians, we have that portion of God's Word that is addressed to carnal Christians. And uh, we talked a little bit about the word carnal, carnality. We, we tried to define that word. Uh, carnality t uh, was defined for me as a young man. I should say more like a young boy in the church in which my folks took me. You know, that was playing cards, you know, on Sunday, you know, listening to Willie Nelson music, going to movies, dancing, playing checkers with, you know, for money or whatever. And I finally argued my parents into letting me play poker for matchsticks, so I knew what carnality was. It seems to me the Holy Spirit has precisely defined carnality in 1 Corinthians. Carnality questions the authority of the Word of God. Carnality results in immorality. Carnality leads to a callous attitude towards sin. Carnality leads to infighting and squabbling among brethren in the body of Christ. Carnality leads to an insistence of our own rights, even if we have to go to law. Carnality leads to fornication. Carnality leads to infidelity in the marriage relationship and the sanctity of those commitments to one another. Carnality leads to an idolatry, to an association with that which God calls idolatrous. Carnality, it leads to the impurity of worship. Carnality leads to a misuse of of the spiritual gifts and carnality leads to a dimming of our hope that our citizenship is above. We have a blessed hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We also have further learned that God Almighty is greatly concerned about such an attitude, so concerned in fact that He would have His ministers leave an effective ministry at Troas to go to minister to carnal believers. That the evangelistic proclamation of the Word of God dimmed in importance compared to the welfare of these carnal Christians. Now I believe in 2 Corinthians we have seen a response to the Word of God. First of all, that, that tells me that the carnal Christian is not in a hopeless situation. I used to sit and tremble in services when I was a young teenager because the pastor weighed me down with guilt and, and the belief that I would never be able to, to make the cut. And I read Corinthians today and I see in the kindness and the love and the grace, the sovereignty of my God, that my situation was not hopeless. I see that the solution to carnality is turning to the Word of God earnestly and in sincerity. And I see that the results of that turn produces great joy, not just in my own heart, but in the heart of God toward me. That there's a restoration of fellowship and communion between that Christian and God and, and between other Christians. 
I think we are looking at the reestablishment of that communion and that fellowship horizontally between believers and that actually these chapters are precisely opposite from what many a commentator would ask me to believe. You know, rather than a revelation of a, of a carnality in the life of Paul, they're, they're, a, they're a great revelation of the heart of God as to what happens in the life of a believer who's in fellowship with God. You and I need fellowship together in the Word of God. And then the outworking of that will surface in our daily walk. You know, it seems to me a casual glance at the chapters, just looking at them casually, we find that, first of all, whatever is involved in this giving for the necessity of the saints was not to evangelize Jerusalem. You know, it didn't appear to be uh, to build a new missionary outreach program. Now, I hope I'm not being overly critical. I don't want to be. I simply want to point out that obviously the urgency in this practical outworking of spiritual communion and fellowship with God is for the necessity of the saints. And it doesn't appear that it's for the support of the ministers either. In fact, it, it seems pretty clear, that, at least to me, that the supreme purpose in this, in this gathering was not at all to support Paul and Titus and Timothy, but rather for other believers who are in need. Seems to me one of the first principles now presented to us in the Word of God as far as Christian giving is concerned is that that giving is primarily centered in the needs of the body of Christ. That could be money. That could be other things as well. I don't think it's limited to just money. And that seems rather far afield, really off, way off course is what I would say from many of the appeals that I hear today. However, the Holy Spirit doesn't start there. You know, we simply garner that from the text. The Holy Spirit starts with the fact that it is a grace of God. I want to make known to you the grace of God which had previously been bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. Whatever's happening in these churches is not because somebody decided to do something great. The glory has to go back to God. I want you to know about God's grace, perfect passive, having been bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He doesn't say saints. He says, he says the called out ones. It would seem to indicate that these are groups of believers, uh, not one group, but different groups of believers. And that what is happening is an evidence of God's grace. So the glory goes back to God. In the second verse... It happens in a great trial of affliction. The word trial is a common word in the New Testament. Uh, Dokamas, uh, it means to prove something or test something to prove that it's good. If there is to be any validity to my faith, then it must be done in a trial of affliction. How do you know that you love God if there's no affliction in your life? How do you know that you trust Him if there's never any occasion to trust Him? How do, you, how do you know that you rest in Him if there are no occasions of restlessness? I think we need to realize that it's an expression of the love and the greatness of our God that it's done in a great trial of affliction. Not only was it done in a great trial of affliction, it resulted in the abundance of their joy their deep poverty, how that, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. 
Now, that's, that's the authorized version translation. It's a, it's a difficult passage to translate. Here were churches in Macedonia that were in deep trouble. This is not, this was not a popular time, dearly beloved, to be a follower of Christ, historically speaking. But I think the lesson is true for us today, just as it was for them. That simply because we are in present affliction and great difficulty, that should not in any way stem our joy nor the abundance of our liberality. Verse 3, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Now I bear witness. This is the Holy Spirit speaking. I bear witness. Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. I think one of the greatest miracles of the new creation is the change of the will. You know, the question often comes up in a Bible class, do you mean that you can sin all that you want and go to heaven? And, and I've mentioned this a hundred times at least, I think, on this channel. There is that inside unexplained change of the want. I am absolutely certain that every brother and sister in Christ on earth this very moment is already sinning more than they want to. What changed in that want? Did you do it? One of the great miracles of God's grace, dearly beloved, is that there was in fact a change in the will. They were willing of themselves, says the text. That's an evidence of God's grace. Because the Scriptures declare that we were not born by our will, nor by the will of man, but by the will of God, that's John 1.13, and that the carnal mind is enmity against God. It cannot please God, and it cannot do the will of God. And so there again is the evidence of the greatness of His grace as it worked in the Macedonian believer. In fact, they entreated the Lord, beseeching us. And, and I am suggesting to you that the us is, is more than Paul and Timothy and Titus. That they would receive the gift. The word is grace. Uh, uh, you see Duran, uh, the word Duran in the Greek is, is gift, uh, charis. Uh, some, some people call it charis. Charis or charis equals grace. Now, I mentioned to you last week that the word grace appears seven times in the 8th chapter. And for those of you who are super expert on numbers, you know, you know that that's the number of perfection or whatever you want to call it. That, you know that we ought to have seven elders, you know, seven points in a, in a sermon, seven days in a week, and, you know, and so on and so forth. And, and, and uh, you, if you know me, you know I don't run down any concept of numbers. But neither do I want to exalt it above a level that God does. I think here it's a matter of context. But the word grace occurs seven times in this chapter, and one of them is in the fourth verse. And I believe any time the Holy Spirit repeats Himself or mentions something continually, there's, He's really drawing our attention to that. And in this case, it just happens to be the word grace. Uh, beseeching us with much entreaty that we would receive the grace. Here, here translated gift. I think gift is probably a, a proper translation as long as you realize it comes from the, the same root as charis, the word grace. And that we would not only receive this, but we would take it upon, up upon ourselves the fellowship of ministering to the saints. So the response to carnality or the answer, if you will, to carnality is a response to the Word of God which results in a willingness to minister to the saints. 
that ought to be the prime concern. I mean, I, I believe it is the, the only concern of the new, nat the new nature, the new man. And it seems as though as a Christian institution, our country at least, has departed from the preeminence of that concern. And they did this not as, not as we had hoped, but first of all, they gave themselves to the Lord and unto us. My Bible says, by the will of God. It's clear they gave themselves to us and they gave themselves to the Lord. I believe, first of all, there's the indication that there is a unity in that Paul, Timothy, and Titus represent God and then gave themselves to the Lord by means of the will of God. And as in verse 1, we cannot, we cannot depart, we should not depart from the sovereignty and the glory and the majesty of God. This happened by means of the will of God. And we could spend a lot of time there. We could talk about, you know, permissive will that, that uh, God really wanted it. And, and he, he opened the door and he made it possible. But it still depends on you. Or we could come to the other side of sovereignty and say, no, no, no. God willed this and this is what happened. And I don't know where you are. On that, I'm more than willing to admit that I'm over here on the sovereignty side. I believe, dearly beloved, that what happened in Corinth, both before and after the giving of the Word of God to the believers at Corinth, was so that you and I could see that in the Word of God, it was according to His plan, that it worked out by means of the will of God. How many things do you suppose we complain about where God is working in our lives for someone else's good? I'm not suggesting to you that it, it did not work for the good of the Corinthians. I mean, was it, was it to Stephen's good, to his benefit, that he was stoned? Well, I'm certain it was, or my God lied. I am not certain that in what appeared to be a very difficult circumstance in the life of Stephen, God didn't use that greatly in the life of Saul the Apostle. I do read in Romans, it was not for his sake alone that it was written that he believed God and it was counted for righteousness. You know, imagine that, that many thousands of years ago, God is saying something to Abraham, not for Abraham alone, but because God in His sovereign power can look out through all the ages of history and see every life that is touched by that proclamation. Something surely happened in Corinth that was physical and historical. There was a response to the Word of God. Lives were changed. Surely lives from the standpoint of, of the human viewpoint, at least, had, had been dramatically affected. But I think that the overriding principle is that it was done for you and for me and for all others who are members of the body of Christ. And what I see is a practical outworking of a spiritual regeneration in the life of the believers at Corinth bracketed in verse 1 by God's grace and in verse 5 by God's will in so much that we entreated Titus that, that as he had begun in Corinth he would also finish in you this same grace and once again this ministering to the needs of other believers is called grace not burden but grace therefore verse 7 Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Now, it would be the easiest thing in the world to suggest that, that that's their faith. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to argue that. I am persuaded that we are absolutely predisposed to maximize the faith of the individual and minimize the faithfulness of God. 
I am not going to suggest that the faith of those believers at Corinth is not at all in view. I am going to suggest, however, at least for your own thinking, that what they are abounding in is the faithfulness of God. I read in Ephesians, For by grace are you saved by means of faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Walk in what? Good works. Mine or Christ Jesus's. I'm persuaded that the good works in which I walk are the works of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the finished work of Christ, not the good works of, of paganism by which I gain some merit in order to gain access to glory. Verse 7, Therefore, as ye abound in everything in faith, I'm going to look at, I'm going to say that, call that God's faithfulness, and utterance, poor translation, in my opinion. The word is logos, it's speech, and knowledge, and I have to take that as God's word. And in all diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. So we start out with God's faithfulness, God's word, our experiential appropriation and knowledge of God's faithfulness and God's Word, which results in diligence and love. And when I look at the word abound here, I'm bound to think of God's grace. Not in law, commandment, says the King James there, but through the earnestness, the, the word can be translated enthusiasm, through the enthusiasm of others, proving your love is genuine, legit. That's what I believe the text is saying. So it seems to me the verse is a beautiful, concise statement of a renewed life that has come out of carnality, one freed from law, man-made bondage to the freedom, the liberty that we have in Christ. We abound in the faithfulness of God. We abound in the Word of God. The result of that is our knowledge, our zeal, and love. If, you know, we know faith, hope, and love is the very root system of the Christian experience. Your labor of love, your patience of hope, your work of faith. We see that in almost every epistle, this same concept presented. Since this is true, then see that you also abound in this grace. And, and it would almost seem to me that the Holy Spirit has gone out of His way to insist that we recognize that this is God's grace, not, our, not something that came about as a result of our design, our ingenuity, our genius, our wisdom, not our faith or diligence, Oh, you know, oh man, if you could only see my vision. If I could just get you to cooperate with this great vision that I had, then we could change history before the Lord comes back or, or, you know, or something like that. And folks, our eyes are taken off of the faithfulness, the sovereignty, and the power of our God to some man-made plan or scheme to do something that apparently God isn't getting done and boy, if we don't get it done, billions of people are going to go to hell. Dearly beloved, I don't think that's what the verses say. This is God's grace, and because it's God's grace, then it will get done. And we have the opportunity to abound in that grace. We can certainly shirk our duty, but God is going to reach that heart. What an extreme privilege. What a marvelous opportunity to be one touched by grace, to exercise that grace. 
I don't worship a God who is so fragile or powerless that His plan of things could collapse were I to turn out to be unfaithful. You know, here is an opportunity for these believers not only to share in, but to abound in this grace. It seems as though the Holy Spirit immediately says, now wait a minute, I, I don't say this by commandment. The, 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 and the not there, folks, is the absolute negative. I, I absolutely, I absolutely do not speak by commandment. I think that's twofold. If you're looking only at Paul's authorship, then you have Paul saying, you know, I haven't been commanded to say this. On the other hand, if we continue to be consistent in our belief that the Holy Spirit is the author, the Holy Spirit rushes in here to say, this is absolutely not a commandment. You who are going to miss the opportunity to abound in this grace, this is no commandment. This is spoken by, by means of the occasion of the earnestness of others and an opportunity to prove, to, to test the sincerity of your love. It's abso absolutely reasonable to me that if I am ever to understand how deep my trust in God really is, it must be put to the test. If it's never put to the test, we're just using shallow words. It is not inconsistent with God's grace and God's love that our love should be put to the test. Do you really love? Has there really been a change from the carnality that was revealed to us in 1 Corinthians to the spirituality that's been suggested in 2 Corinthians? Is it that unreasonable that, that there would be a practical outworking of that? You know, we, we want to make Christianity something that is so much fun. You know, I, we don't want to go along with the apostles exhorting the brethren that, that daily they must enter in with, with great affliction. That's not the Christianity. That's not Christianity as we hear it preached today. You know, man, it's, it's a solution to all your problems. You know, if you've got problems in your family and in your life and in your job, obviously you're not walking very close with the Lord. But, if, but man, I, if you'll just get close to the Lord, you can straighten all that out. Horse feathers. If in any way... We base our relationship with God and one another upon an obligation so that you are put under some kind of obligation. Dearly beloved, we have departed far, far from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The supreme illustration of the ninth verse is that Christ was not obligated to do what He did. You'll notice that the, the eighth verse says, I don't speak by commandment. And the twelfth verse says, if there be a willingness of mine, if, there be, if there's a willingness already there, then it's accepted according to what a man has and not according to what he doesn't have. And so the ninth verse sits in there, not as, you know, here's an example of someone who gave everything they had and that's what we ought to do. No, the ninth verse sits in there saying that this is the grace of God and that what we were told in verse 9 was not by way of example, but by way of, of foundation for our participation in ministering to the saints the grace of God. It isn't based upon effort or obligation. Christ was not obligated to die in your place. Christ did not have to do it, or it's not grace. We do not have to give. We do not have to minister to the saints from a standpoint of obligation. We do, however, do that from a standpoint of grace. Well, we'll look more at that this next week. Thank you for joining us. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.